Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, thanking you for, um, man, you're just amazing, and, and you're so graceful and such a blessing to us that sometimes it's overwhelming to even believe that something so good is true. So help us with our unbelief. Um, help us with our lack of appreciation, our discontentment. Lord, help us with our just uh, falling short and rebellion. As we get into your word, Lord, we always ask for conviction. We ask for challenge. We ask for change. We ask to be uh, broken and built up, stirred by your Holy Spirit to righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in um, 1 Samuel chapter 12. This is entitled, Consider Consider the Great Things. So for a little recap, we began the book by meeting um, Elkanah and Hannah. Uh, and Hannah couldn't have a son. And she was blessed by the Lord miraculously with Samuel. Samuel grew up in the tabernacle, serving under Eli, being discipled properly, while Eli himself failed as a father. We met Eli's wicked sons. Um, God took care of them and Eli all in the same day. And Samuel was catapulted to being Israel's new spiritual leader. But in that process, he also ended up back home with his mom. Remember, she gave him away when he was just three or four years old. Then we saw Israel come together for the Lord. And the Lord conquer the Philistines. After he had gave them hemorrhoids. <laughs> then the people forgot about all the Lord had done for them. Because, as we will see, they were Janet Jackson believers. And they asked for a king. In the process, we meet Saul. Not trying to be king, not trying to be famous, just simply looking for donkeys. And he gets placed on the throne as the king. Now, we've been going through this whole thing with Saul, and, and I've been hearing from a lot of you guys that you have a whole new perspective on Saul, according to the scriptures, not according to what you have heard. And that's that's awesome, because that's always what we want. We want... I mean, it's sad when the actual word of God is unique because people are teaching something opposite. But that's if that's unique, that's where we want to stay. We want to stay unique. We want to stay to the scripture. OK, so as we have seen, Saul was a humble guy. He was committed. He was caring. He wasn't looking for God, per se, as in trying to, you know, serve him spectacular or be somebody famous. He was just obediently being a son in his father's house doing what he was supposed to do. And then when he was put into place, he didn't step up and, and toot his horn. He was like, you know, this is a bit much, right? Then last week in chapter 11, after some people whose hearts had been touched by God went with Saul to be his counselors, his, his mentors, his disciplers, his fellowship buddies in the ministry. While Saul is back at home gardening and, and, and taking care of the herds and just doing what he's always done, we met Serpent, Nahash, coming against the city of Jabesh Gilead. And, and tells them, I'm going to kill you and conquer you unless you poke out your right eyes. And they say, right eye, die, come out to you. 
give us seven days. He's like, sure, take all the time you want. They send for Saul. Saul gathers the army. They come and wipe out the Ammonites. And now everybody supports Saul as king. And this is where we are in chapter 12. Was that a good recap? All right, praise God. First Samuel chapter 12, consider the great things. Now, Saul is the nation's civic ruler, our king. Samuel will call the nation's spiritual leader, our pastor. Saul represents the government. Samuel represents the church. What we see is God's established institutions, the church and the government, walking together as one in submission to him. Last in, in chapter 11, when Saul called Israel to war, he said, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. Remember, he chopped up the oxen and sent them all through Israel. And it says, and the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. At this time, all of Israel came together as one nation under God. Psalms 33, 12 says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. So if you go back and read chapter 11, you see Saul submitting to the spiritual headship that God had placed in order. He didn't say, I'm the king. I don't have to listen. He said, come to battle with Samuel and Saul. Chapter 12. Now Samuel said to all of Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you, and I am old and gray-headed. And look. My sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whom's, whom, or from whose hand have I received any bribe? with which to blind my eyes, I will restore it. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have taken anything from any man's hand. Then Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. Okay, so chapter 12 is kind of a parenthesis happening between all the action that's going on, right? When Samuel told them, you're going to get a king, and the king is going to take, 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 tax, 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 and you're complaining about the way I have been leading. So in light of all of that, he says, now you got your king. Let's hold court. See, after Moses and Joshua, judges ruled in Israel because they had no king. But now the rule of judges is officially over, and now there's a king ruling in Israel. So as Samuel steps down from being Israel's civic leader and transfers that power to Saul, he addresses the nation. He says, listen here, since I was a child, I have led Israel and all of you know my character and my history as a ruler. But now I'm old and gray headed and my sons are with you. In other words, he was saying, even though the office of judges is passing away, I'm still here. I'm still here to advise and offer any advice to the king from my experience as Israel's leader and judge. Now, this reference to his sons could mean that they're here as well to assist because they have experience as judges, and he probably still hoped they would make right choices. Or it could be that he fired them 
and completely removed them because of their corruption. And now they were just regular citizens standing in the crowd with everybody else. It's kind of hard to tell. But Samuel's like, listen, Israel, check this out. I'm too old for your shenanigans. So let's hold court. I'll be the defendant, and each and every one of you will be the witnesses before God of heaven and his king that he's anointed to rule over you. Now anybody who can testify against me for taking a bribe to rule in their favor or taking a bribe to rule against them, step up. Anybody who can testify against me of taking advantage of them by robbery, coercion, or any other form of manipulation, step up. Anybody who can testify against me of me using my authority authority to wrongfully hold them down or use my position to crush them, step up. And anybody, whoever has a case against me, step up, make your charge, state your claim, and I will repay whatever you say that I owe. And everyone answered and testified before God and before their king, Samuel, you are a good, godly, and honest man, and you have served the nation righteously. And they did this before God and their new king as their witness to have it on record that Samuel had never done anything wrong. So think about it like this. You ever have a conversation with somebody, you make a deal with somebody, and then after the deal doesn't turn out the way they want, they go back and say you did something wrong in the process, right? Okay, they wanted this king, right? Now when things start going sideways, they can't say, oh God, it was because of Samuel that we wanted the king. Because, you know, he was treating us so bad. Well, oh, you already went to court. Does it make sense? All right. Verse 6. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers from the land of Egypt. Now, stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazar, into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherahs. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jerubbabel, Bedan, Jephna, Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt safe in safety. And when you saw Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, come against you, you said, No, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. So he just recounted their entire history, how when they were obedient to God, they were victorious in God. And by their own admission, when they turned from God and embraced other things, they became oppressed. Every act of God toward Israel was a righteous act. When he raised up judges to deliver them from their oppression, it was a righteous act. When he disciplined them and allowed them to be oppressed as a result of their chosen disobedience, it was a righteous act. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. 
For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now, though chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful, nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Sometimes it takes a whooping to make your mind get right. (laughs) That's it. I mean, there's no amount of conversation. There's no amount of time out. There's no, it just, oh, that's what you meant. Right? Now, all of us are different. There are some children. Let's see, I had a bunch of kids. So I had, if there was different personalities, we had Winnie the Pooh because they were all over the place. Right? We had Tigger. Tigger will wait till 10 o'clock at night when he's supposed to be in the bed and get out the bed. And stick his big head out the door, look at us in, there, in his room, and say, "On your mark, and set, go!" And run to the kitchen to go make some cereal. Turn on all the lights, and he get help back to bed every night. Then we have Mister Compliant. He do anything wrong, and you say, "Really?" And he would just crumble. Okay, kid got probably three whoopings in his whole life. The other one can't count. Got buff whooping him. So some people are different, you know, some people, some of us need a little bit more help than others to understand. But however the Lord chastises you is for your good. Just be trained by it, right? Don't complain. And so when the Lord gave them their heart's desire to be like the rest of the world and have a king, it was still a righteous act. See, every act of God is good and righteous, even when he gives us a taste of our own medicine. And if you ever have a question about the goodness of God, James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and it comes down from the Father lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Meaning God is always bright, God is always right, God is always love, and God is always true. There's no shade on it, ever. But because of their desire for the things that God had forbidden, they rejected obediently serving the Lord time and time again and exchanged the worship of the true God for the worship of false gods who would offer their flesh whatever it desired. Think about this. I don't want to do it God's way because he's not going to give me what I want. So I'm going to go this way because this God says you can have it any way you want it. Now, that was their chosen disobedience. But there's another side to that coin. And it puts us on that same path. See, Israel rejected wanting to obey the Lord. But for many believers, it's our heart's desire to be obedient to the Lord and to worship and serve him faithfully. We haven't forgotten all that he's done for us and everything that he's delivered us from. And we don't push him aside. And we don't push aside all his past and his present goodness toward us. However, our flesh constantly hammers us into sinning. Our wicked desires, bad attitudes, wayward thoughts, shameful actions just won't stop overtaking us like waves pounding against the shore. And under this constant pressure, Eventually, discouragement sets in. Depression takes hold because it seems no matter how hard I try, no matter how much I pray, no matter what I do, I just cannot, or rather, I will not change. And the truth is, inside, I know all the fault lies with me. That's the truth. But what it feels like is God is just sitting there watching me struggle 
as I drown in my own sin? Or he's so displeased, he's put up a wall and he's blocking me from getting to him. See, it's at these points many of us just give up because there's no hope if God doesn't do it for me. So, instead of continuing on this path of constant failure, conviction, guilt, and grief, and even though I love the Lord with all my heart, want nothing more than to be right with him, I'll just go with the devil. Because this whole time, he's been in my ear. He's offering me the lie of the easy way out. But then once I take his hand and he gets me where he wants me to be, he holds me captive or he'll try to completely destroy me. Listen, believer. God is good. God is true. He's always right there in the struggle with you. And in spite of what it feels like, the Lord loves you. And he's not shut the door on you, nor is he indifferent to your struggle and your cries for help. See, this is the word of God, not the feelings of man. The word of God says in John 6, 37, Jesus said, all that the father gives me will come to me. And the one that comes to me, I will by no means reject, cast out or drive away. The word of God says in Joshua 1, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Have not I commanded you to be strong and of good courage? Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. But in those seasons, what the Lord is doing is building your strength. He's building your faith. He's building your hope. He's building your character. And he's changing your identity to be like Christ. Think of a butterfly struggling to get out of its cocoon. Now. In that struggle, that butterfly may wish it could just return to its life of a caterpillar. I mean, it was simple, just eat, right? But since that's impossible, it may feel just like it should quit and die in its cocoon. But God placed in the butterfly an unwavering hope that drives him on until he breaks through to the other side. And when he does, he does something that he could never do as a caterpillar. He soars freely away from everything that once held him down. In that struggle, in that battle, in that pressing, in that trying to break out of that cocoon and just wanting to yield and give in to the devil's offer to take the easy way out. And you feel like God has left you, for abandoned you, is not helping you. God says, I didn't call you to feel. I call you to walk in faith. I called you to embrace my word, to be in the spirit, not in your emotions. Isaiah 54, 4 through 8 says, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For the Lord, your God, will cause you to forget the shame of your youth, and you will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He's called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. I'm not a woman, but I know by observation 
how it crushes women to be forsaken. How that first love tosses you aside. God says, I'm your husband. Now, ultimately, we're all the bride of Christ, so we're all his woman. <laughs> so I'm trying to, you know, doubt, it's in there. It's, it's in there. He says, but for a mere moment, I have forsaken you. You know that struggle? Oh, God, I'm drowning. You're not helping me. He's like, no, you got it. Oh, blah, 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 blah. You got it. But with great mercies, I will gather you. Now you were in your sin, and with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So he says, take up the whole armor of God that you can be with, able to withstand the evil day. And having all done all you can, stand some more. For the Lord himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the point is, my beloved brothers and sisters, don't give up before the breakthrough. It may feel like you're going to die, but that's just the flesh dying to the power of sin. And guess what? When self dies, joy comes in the morning. So Samuel, he he he's he's rehearsing their rebellious history and how God has brought them through. And in their last big confrontation, when the Ammonites came against them, they cried out for a king. Verse 13, he says, Now, therefore, here is your king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. So Samuel, he's letting all of Israel know that Saul is the literal fulfillment of everything they wanted in a king according to what appeals to the flesh. Then he lets them know just in case they ever get things twisted, it was the Lord who gave them all that they wanted in the person of Saul. In other words, when they come down with Boulder's remorse, they only need to refer back to chapter 8, verse 18, when God says, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. And right after that, they said, still, give us a king. Remember, he gave them a long list before that. He's going to take, 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 and then you're going to cry out, and I'm not going to listen. Verse 14. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and your king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. In other words, what he's saying is, now that we're here, it doesn't matter how we got here. What matters is going forward. What matters is your devotion to the Lord. As long as the king and the people truly honor the Lord, they will continue following the Lord. But if you choose to disobey him, especially after you said, Lord, all we need is a king, and if you give us a king, we'll be satisfied. And if you give us a king, we'll be satisfied and serve you faithfully. If you rebel after you said all of that and I gave you what you want, the Lord is just going to open up a can of chastisement 
and release the Kraken. Just like he did to your forefathers in the past. You ever give somebody everything they want and they're still not happy? Not me. You'll just be a miserable. <laughs> you know, it's ir- it, 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 it's it's funny how those irritating irritating those adult parental talks were when you were a kid, right? In your mind, you're thinking blah 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 blah. You're just mad because you're old, blah, blah, blah. You're mad because it didn't work for you, blah, blah, blah. We're younger and smarter than you. You old people didn't know what you were doing. And then you find yourself repeating those same sentences, paragraphs, discussions with your own kids. Why? Because you tried everything they warned you not to, thinking that you were the exception to the rule. And then you found out history repeats itself from one generation to the next. And the reason why it repeats itself is because man is a vapor. But the righteous God and his judgment is forever. So you're here this long. Right. And you're going to do what you're going to do because, you know, you've never been there. It's like talking to a 15 year old. They got a whopping 15 years on the planet and 15-year-old wisdom that's brand new to them. (laughs) You need to get it, right? And you're like, "Mm, dude, I I done turned 15 12 times. It's not going to (laughs) work. But that's how you are with God. You're here this long. Everybody before you tried it that long. God is still here like it ain't going to work. That's what Samuel was telling them. This is what your fathers did. And I'm telling you now. (laughs) Just get ready for the can of. Whoa. Because you're doing the same thing they did. So he says, verse 16. Now stand and see the great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God. Now he's your God, right? Calm him down, that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sins the evil in asking a king for ourselves. All right, the time of wheat harvest is in May. And in Israel, that's the dry season. Now, heavy rain during harvest season destroys crops. So the Lord was demonstrating both his power and his judgment against the nation by a thunderous rainstorm. But check this out. God waited till after Saul had been anointed king and accepted fully by the entire nation to show them the depth of their sin. See, because at this point, there's no take back. You can't. They were at the point where it can't be like, oops, God, we didn't mean it. Nope. He warned you every step of the way, and you insisted. Now that the whole nation has said, yes, he's our king, God says, this is how bad it is. Remember, this whole thing of getting the king was going to be like marrying the person you chose instead of waiting for the one God had for you. 
And then once you say I do, there's no take backs. Often in life, there's times that we just do not understand the depth of our sin. And that's because our flesh protects itself from owning the truth of our own guilt. So God has to step in and do something to make me see just how wicked me and my actions are. And when he does, it's seeing my sin through God's commandments that suddenly and clearly sin becomes exceedingly sinful. You know, like growing up, you know, doing the stuff I used to do, I, I got arrested, a, you know, a bunch of times, or whatever, and had to go to court and, you know, trials and all that stuff. But they would give you your arrest report. Now, in the arrest report, it tells you everything that happened from the commencement of the crime to you got arrested, right? And it'll say something like suspect charge that victim. No, suspect wasn't charging that victim. Suspect was trying to get away from police, right? But victim felt attacked. So you're reading this stuff, and you're like, well, who did all that? That, that is not what happened, <laughs> right? But that's what happened. And, and sometimes God brings you your arrest report so that you can see just how bad it is, right? Because to us, you know, well, it's not that bad. Well, it's not really what I meant. Okay, but that's what you did. And these are the effects. And now own it. All right. <clears throat> Can somebody tell Kim to close this window? <coughs> okay. Verse 20. Then Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. So Samuel was like this. Now that you guys have finally gotten a clue that is the rainstorm let you see just how sinfully wicked it was for your asking for a king in the way that you did. Don't worry. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious. And in spite of your sin, he delights in showing his glory through forgiveness and granting restarts. So for this day going forward, don't turn away from faithfully following the Lord. Because if you turn away from following the Lord, you will turn to pursue following things that are empty. And no matter what it is that you pursue, be it money, power, possessions, relationships, or any other insane fantasy created by your emotions. All of it is worthless, and none of it has eternal value. You know, as people, people, for some reason, we think or feel, rather I should say, that if I believe it, it must be true. If I want it, it must be right. No, that's just you all by yourself. Right? And now you're trying to force your insanity onto everyone else. And my answer is, let the Joker stay in Arkham. Arkham, it's the, it's the mental asylum on Batman, which where they put all the crazy people. <laughs> But see, when you let the joker out, 
you know, the Joker wants everybody to submit to the Joker. And we have to recognize, am I being a Joker in this situation? Because I feel it so strong. How come everybody isn't getting it? Man, probably because you're the one on the wrong side. But it can't be me. How can it be? I want it. Right? So Samuel says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But Jesus said in Luke 16, 13, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And God knows your hearts, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So those things that we elevate, are an abomination to the Lord. And one of the things that we elevate is my own feelings, thoughts, emotions, and desires. It must be because I want it to be. Verse 22. Samuel continues, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it pleased the Lord to make you his people. So now he's talking to Israel. Um, why did God, or why is Israel God's chosen nation? Especially after the ways that they've treated him. I mean, what makes them so special? The answer is nothing other than it's God's choice. In Deuteronomy 7, 7, God says to Israel, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep his oath, which he swore to his father, to your fathers. And then in Deuteronomy 9, 6, God said, Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. God was telling Israel, listen, there's nothing special about you. In fact, you're the most hard-headed nation on the planet. But because I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will be faithful to complete it. Now, when we flip that around to us personally as individuals, because if you look at Israel's entire history, you can compartmentalize that into your life. Right? Oh, God, help me, save me, get me out of Egypt. Snatch you out, part the Red Sea, cross the Jordan River. I don't want to go in there. Okay, whoop, 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 wander around in the desert. Oh, you're God. Oh, no, you're not. Right? You get what I'm saying? If God cannot keep Israel, he cannot keep you. But he gave his word before all of creation when he saved you and said, this one is mine. I'll never leave him nor forsake him. And since God cannot lie or fail, he will never leave you nor forsake you. That's his word. And it has nothing to do with you. You got nothing to offer him. Really? What, I mean, what are you going to give God? All your righteousness is as look up that word rags and filthy. And that's what you're handing him. Here you go, Lord. Scripture tells us this in Acts 4. There is no other name than Jesus under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And in Philippians 2, it tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Nothing is greater than the name of Jesus except Psalms 138.2 tells us you have magnified your word above all your name. 
So because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people and it's God's name that's on the line, he will do all that he said concerning Israel as a nation and for each one of us as individual believers because it's his word. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. It pleased him to make you his child. To the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us acceptable in the beloved. Why did he choose you? Because he loves you. What made you lovable? Absolutely nothing. This is what separates our faith from every other faith there is in existence. Every other faith tells you, you do this, that, and the other, and you make yourself worthy, and then you are accepted, then you inherit whatever kind of heaven they believe in, right? Our faith tells us, you're dust, you got nothing to offer, you're not worth anything, and God came to get you just because he loves you. Oh, and by the way, you can't help him out along the way. So are you saying I'm nothing? Pretty much. But isn't that a good thing? Rather than thinking you're more than you're not. That demonstrates the love of God, not the worthiness of man. So verse 23. Samuel says, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and right way. Now, Samuel could have taken it personal. He could have taken it to heart that the people rejected him and the Lord as their leaders over the nation. He could have chosen to be bitter towards those people who wanted to do things differently than the way he thought they should have them. And then he could have caught the attitude and refused to pray for them. You know, there are a lot of people that if you have an idea or an opinion or a thought opposite of theirs, they are embittered toward you. How dare you have free will? But Samuel was a mature believer walking with God. So he let him know no matter what, I will continue to pray for you. He didn't say I will start praying for you. He said I will continue to pray for you. And I will continue to disciple you in all the ways of the Lord. For us, you know, often we have a loved one. Or we're told about someone else's loved one in a bad situation. Uh, It could be a health crisis or a self-created circumstance. And we pray fervently and more often for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus commanded us to pray even more often and more fervent for our enemies and those who have misused and abused us so that they can be broken, crushed, reversed, overthrown, and saved by the Holy Spirit. See, in Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, I say to you, pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? So are you praying for your enemies? Good, salvation, right relationship with the Lord, as much as you're praying for your wayward loved ones? It's just a question. Verse 24, 25, and closing. 
Samuel says, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you will still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Now, this is where the Janet Jackson Christian runs into trouble with the Lord. See, the Janet Jackson Christian doesn't walk with the Lord with a content heart and a right attitude. Their discontentment with God has them saying to God, yeah, I know you did great things for me in the past. And you want me to serve you now in truth with my whole heart. But what have you done for me lately? Unthankfulness with God does not lead to glorifying God, nor does it lead to having a desire to keep God in your mind. In fact, it drives one to push the Lord as far out of mind and life as possible. And the result is turning aside, going after empty things that cannot prosper, and yet somehow convincing and believing within yourself that because of my great wisdom, I'll make it happen. But not realizing that in the profession of this great wisdom, my foolish heart has become darkened. In Isaiah 1, 16 through 20, the Lord states this. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from, behind, from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. So he's saying, clean yourself. Make yourself pure by stop doing what's evil in my eyes. Not in your own eyes. In my eyes. See, God's line doesn't move. My line, it changes according to, you know, if I like it, then it's okay. What you're doing ain't okay because I don't like it, right? Now, if I like it, then it's okay. Seek justice. What is justice? Justice is only that which is right in God's sight. I can't do what was done to me and be justified in it. It's still sin. But he continues. He says, come now, let us reason together. In other words, God says, you got a problem with the way I run the universe, the way I created the world, the way things are operating. Let's sit down across the table and argue it out. And then I'm going to show you where you're wrong. See, because though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, sometimes people are afraid to be honest with God. It's not like he doesn't know. But he needs you or he wants you to be honest with him so that you can just see how foolish you actually sound. Really? I mean, because, Lord, you're wrong. You, how dare you did this to me? Okay. In the same breath, God, you're good all the time. You hold my breath in your very hands, you idiot. It don't work. Right? So he says, come now, let us reason together. Let, let's, let's talk this out. But our human nature if I don't talk it out with God, it's never been addressed, and I'm still right. That's why people have conflict in interactions and relationships. Because if I sit down and openly discuss what's going on, I might find out that I'm the one who's totally wrong. And we can't allow that to happen. So I'm not going to say anything. I'll just tell everybody else about it and give it a one-sided slant. But for us, no matter how many 
or what kind of squirrels the enemy throws in your face to distract you, discourage you, create ungratefulness, fear, and doubt. Choose faith in the word of God and don't shrink back from it. It's not about what we feel. And it's not about your own ability to accomplish. It has always been and will forever be about the spirit of God. So don't turn away from following Christ alone. And you won't fall into going after empty things which cannot profit. When we choose reverence for the Lord and nothing else, we'll always be content with God. And when we think about him, all we can do is consider the great things. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your favor. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your word that doesn't waver, buckle, or change, no matter how much we may try to kick and scream or knock it down. You are forever, and you remain. So we glorify you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.